John Granger calls upon his gifts as a classicist, a student of scripture and Christian literature, a teacher, a parent, and a detective to answer the question, why are the Harry Potter books so popular? He develops a thorough case that the Harry Potter books are essentially Christian fantasy, and their popularity can be attributed to human longing for the Christian truths that hide just beneath the surface of the stories. Mr. Granger presents a preponderance of evidence from the text itself, translates advanced literary concepts with ease, and addresses sensitive issues with forthrightness and clarity. Christians who love the Harry Potter books will love them more. Christians who oppose them will have a lot to think about. Quote from Carrie Birmingham, PhD from Pepperdine University. You're listening to How Harry Cast His Spell, The Meaning Behind the Mania for J.K. Rowling's Best-Selling Books, written by John Granger, read by Audrey Dutton. John Granger has played no part in the production of this project except to grant me permission to be able to use his text. John Granger is still actively writing on this subject, to the extent that he is also known as the Hogwarts professor. He also delves into Rawlings' more recent work with a particular focus on her book, The Christmas Pig. To access more of Granger's insights, visit hogwartsprofessor.com, the Hogwarts Professor Substack page, or listen to the Hogwarts Professor podcast. Acknowledgements. How Harry Cast His Spell is the fourth edition and third title of a book I wrote in 2002 called The Hidden Key to Harry Potter. Way back then, my thesis that Potter mania was the product of the religious meaning and Christian content of J.K. Rowling's books was considered a ridiculous projection of my beliefs forced into the text. Rowling, however, has put the question of my sanity, at least on this count, to rest. On her open book tour of the United States in 2007, after Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows had been published, she told a press conference that she thought the Christian symbolism and meaning of the stories was obvious, and that the scriptural passages in the last book epitomized the whole series. I will always be grateful for the confidence Tyndale had in my arguments, and for the editorial insights of Janice Harris and Lisa Jackson, Catherine Helmers of Helmers Literary Services, my literary agent, and Robert Trexler, editor of CSL, the Bulletin of the New York C.S. Lewis Society, and at Zosima Press, also deserve special mention here. Miss Helmers opened the doors at Tyndale and has kept me from many more mistakes than I care to admit here. Bob Trexler is the best friend and kindred spirit every man needs and no one deserves. His example of the life in Christ is an everyday challenge. I blog at www.hogwartsprofessor.com. I have taught classes at Barnes & Noble University online. I've been a keynote speaker at Harry Potter conferences in Orlando, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, and Toronto, and I've communicated via email with many people who read my books. I welcome you to email me. My address is at the bottom of this page. The community of friends I have in Harry Potter fandom consequently has grown to the point that listing their names would constitute its own chapter. My Harry Potter friends and correspondents have been the best part of this seven-year adventure. Last on this short list, but first in my heart, is my family. Thank you, Hannah, Sarah, Sophia, Methodios, Anastasia, Timothy, and Zosima for letting me share what were originally just our Potter conversations with the world. We've largely grown up together with Harry and friends since our Harry Potter adventure began in 2000, and I like to think our happiness is another demonstration of what I argue in this book. John Granger, john at hogwartsprofessor.com. Publisher's Preface Dear Reader, some may wonder why a publisher of distinctly Christian books would publish a book about the Harry Potter series, which, while phenomenally successful, has been criticized by some groups within the Christian community. The answer is really quite simple. Millions of young people are reading the Harry Potter books. Providing parents with a wonderful opportunity to use stories their children love to read to start discussions with them about Christian ideas and values, and about how to evaluate the worldview embedded in any piece of literature. We hope How Harry Cast His Spell will serve as a catalyst for such discussions and as a bridge to growth in faith and spiritual understanding. Introduction Imagine yourself walking in the park with your dog in the cool of the evening. Just like in the movies, a flying saucer descends from the skies 
and lands gently on the empty softball field behind the vacant warehouse. A little green man drops from a metal ladder under the craft and scurries toward you. You and the dog have seen this played out so many times on late night television that you almost yawn. The little guy doesn't threaten you or order you to take him to your leader. As you may have expected, the Dobby lookalike just wants to talk with you about Harry Potter. After all, doesn't everybody? J.K. Rowling's seven Harry Potter novels sold more than 375 million copies and were translated into more than 60 languages between the publication of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, the original United Kingdom title in 1997, and the end of 2007, the year in which Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows was published. The first five Harry Potter movies each set records for opening box office, and the series as a whole had by early 2008 already surpassed both the 21 film James Bond series and the six Star Wars films as the most successful movie franchise of all time. The alien, like all good travelers, has done his homework about his planet vacation. And I'm betting that all the interplanetary guidebooks these days are urging earthbound tourists to talk about Harry with the natives this year. What else are they all sure to know about? I first heard about Harry Potter and his friends in 2000. I was the homeschooling daddy to seven young children, ages 1 to 12 years old, and I didn't want anything to do with a young wizard in training. From what I had heard from a co-worker, whose judgment on literature I thought was not to be trusted, I assumed the books were serial schlock on the order of R.L. Stein's Goosebumps novels. Being something of a snob, I read the first Potter paperback just so I could explain to my oldest daughter why we don't read trash like this. She calls it my green eggs and ham moment. Overnight, I was transformed from I do not like them in a box, I do not like them with a fox, to reading the stories aloud to the younger children and discussing them at length with the older girls. I remember in that first week of hairy excitement when another colleague at work told me that Christians, as a rule, despised the books. You could have knocked me over with a feather. What's your favorite scene? Back to the little green space guy in the park. My bet is that the question his Earth guidebook recommends, he asks you, is about your favorite scene in the books. Why would he want to know that? Because, besides being a great opening for conversation, unlike Earth's academics, our friend from outer space probably wants to learn something he can take back to the planet Xeno. I'm betting he wants answers to the big question, the only question that really matters about Harry Potter. He wants to know what it is about these books that has made them the shared text of children, parents, and grandparents on every continent and archipelago of the planet. So why do readers young and old love Harry Potter? This is an important question, and the answer is a bit of a shocker. Before I share it with you though, let me explain something I said earlier. I said you could have knocked me over with a feather the day I heard Christians didn't like Harry Potter. You might recall that quite a few Christians in 2000 were, in fact, burning the books and asking that they not be allowed in public or school libraries funded with their tax dollars. Why was I so surprised by that? Because the reason I liked the Harry Potter books so much and the reason I was reading them to my children was the implicit, explicit, and very traditional spiritual, even Christian content of the books, which I thought was as obvious as it was edifying. I was interested enough in this subject that I gave a series of lectures on it at a C.S. Lewis Society gathering and at a local library. Before I knew it, ideas that had been floating around in my head found their way to book form, and in something like a Walter Mitty transformation, I morphed from Latin teacher to Harry Potter expert and media go-to source. How does Harry cast his spell? Someday soon, folks who track this sort of thing to write about the intellectual history of popular culture will be sitting down to put together their notes on prevalent ideas about Harry Potter. What they will find, I'm pretty certain, is an arc of change much like the one described by J.B.S. Haldane. Theories pass through four stages of acceptance. One. This is worthless nonsense. Two, this is an interesting but perverse point of view. Three, this is true but quite unimportant. Four, I always said so. The historians of popular culture tracking how people understood Harry 
will discover that folks thought Harry Potter was 1. Anti-Christian, even demonic. 2. Anti-Christian in the sense of being an invitation into the occult. 3. Not Christian, anti-Christian, or spiritual, just magic. 4. Profoundly Christian, like C.S. Lewis. I always knew it. As broad as the always growing consensus about the depth of the Christian content of the Harry Potter novels, now is broad enough that in a recent documentary about her work, Rowling felt it necessary to deny at length that her purpose in writing was to convert readers to Christianity. It bears recalling that even five years ago, Christian critics of the series had convinced most people, and it seemed all journalists, that Harry was anything but Christian and that these books were dangerous for children to read. How could they have gotten it so wrong? And why did readers believe them? Answering the question, why do readers young and old love Harry Potter, explains the others, because if they had gotten that one right, they couldn't have asserted what they thought about Harry and his author. The answer, believe it or not, is very simple, if frequently misunderstood. Readers love Harry Potter because of the spiritual meaning and Christian content of the books. Let me explain what that doesn't mean before I jump into what it does mean. First, it doesn't mean that the Harry Potter novels were written especially for Christians, with Christians in mind, or most important, for the sole purpose of evangelizing non-believers into accepting the Christian faith. None of those things are true, and none of them have anything to do with the answer to the important question of why we love Harry Potter. Harry Potter is not the Left Behind series, or even the Chronicles of Narnia, in terms of being an in-your-face Christian drama or altar call. Even now that J.K. Rowling has discussed the scriptural quotations in Deathly Hollows, I doubt that her readers would say they love her books because of their Christian meaning, especially her non-Christian readers in the United States, the United Kingdom, and around the world. My guess is that few, if any, readers, adults or children, responded to their first or last Harry Potter adventure with a whoop about the traditional Christian imagery or the literary alchemy that in many ways structures each story. So how can the Christian content of the stories be the reason people love the books if they don't understand this content for what it is and if evangelization wasn't the author's point in writing the novels? The answer to that question is pretty straightforward, but it takes a couple of steps to get into and the rest of this book to explain in detail. Religion and literature have a long history, but almost none of us, even the English majors, studied that relationship in school. So let's start with an expert. The argument begins with Mircea Eliade, a professor at the University of Chicago. In The Sacred and the Profane, the nature of religion and the significance of religious myth, symbolism, and ritual within life and culture. Eliade explained that non-religious man in the pure state is a comparatively rare phenomenon, even in the most desacralized of modern societies. Eliade's point is pretty simple. Human beings are spiritual by design. Whether you believe that design is an accident of evolution or straight from God. By our very nature, humans resist an exclusively secularized world in which our faculties for perceiving a reality saturated with being have no play. It doesn't matter that schools, courts, and lawmakers have made the G word something taboo in education, government functions, and public discourse outside of presidential elections. Human beings live on myth, religion, and spirituality because we're hardwired for it. Modern and postmodern secular cultures that have driven the sacred from the public square are fighting the tide. Our world may be radically different from traditional God-focused civilizations, but it is still crowded with religious elements. As Eliade wrote, a small volume could be written on the myths of the modern man, on the mythologies camouflaged in the plays that he enjoys, in the books that he reads. Even the act of reading serves an important religious or mythic function. Even reading includes a mythological function, because through reading the modern man succeeds in obtaining an escape from time, 
comparable to the emergence from time affected by myths. Whether modern man kills time with a detective story or enters such a foreign temporal universe as is represented by any novel, reading projects him out of his personal duration and incorporates him into other rhythms, makes him live in another history. Accepting Eliade's premises that a. humans are designed to experience the sacred and b. humans will pursue this experience even in a culture that denies both a human spiritual faculty and a spiritual reality per se, answering the question about why we love Harry Potter is a slam dunk. The act of reading itself serves a religious function in a secular culture, but Harry gives us much more than that. Reading about Harry and the world of magic qualities is a respite from a universe without ennobling truth beauty or virtue, but more important, in image, character, and theme, these stories are the vehicles of spiritual meaning and specifically Christian artistry from the English literary tradition. We love Harry Potter because we are designed for religious experience, and these books deliver religious experience the way coal trucks used to deliver fuel into people's basements in a barely controlled avalanche. This isn't an evangelistic mountain slide meant to catch you off guard and force your conversion. It is the rhetoric of great storytelling, with a host of religious and mythic hooks to catch on your Velcro heart. A heart designed to capture and resonate with these hierophanies or intrusions of the sacred. The business of this book is to peel away the layers of that rhetoric so you can understand the various symbols J.K. Rowling uses, the themes she develops, and the many traditional devices and structures she borrows from English greats. Almost all these tools are Christian, but much more to the point, the English literary tradition in which she writes, 12 centuries of it, give or take a few hundred years, is exclusively Christian. This bothers quite a few readers, so it is worth spending a moment to explain. Myth and archetype are okay to these readers, but once something becomes one specific religion, all their defenses go up. I don't know if it is fear of being converted or simply narrow-mindedness, but the heels go in deep against the idea that Harry Potter is written in religious language that is almost exclusively Christian. Even so, there's just no getting around this. It is true that a phoenix, a unicorn, and a griffin are symbols found in cultures around the world. It is true, too, that these magical creatures are understood differently by different cultures compared to the way they are understood by English writers and readers. But in English stories, these symbols have specific Christian meanings, which we will talk about in chapter 9. Not knowing this meaning or insisting on a plurality of other meanings is not broad-mindedness or religious pluralism. It's just ignorance, and if I may be so bold, perhaps a little Christophobic. If Rowling were an Islamofascist, Hindu Brahmin, or Buddhist Gur dweller, when writing an epic adventure in English and within English traditions, her hands would still have been essentially tied to writing a Christian story. This huge monocultural sow, that is the English literary tradition, cannot be butchered in such a way that gets you parliament of religions bacon in slabs. My job in How Harry Cast His Spell is to act as your guide through what I assume is already familiar territory, the seven Harry Potter books, and to point out all the religious and mythical elements specific to the tradition in which J.K. Rowling did her writing. Unless you're a very unusual reader indeed, this will be an eye-popping ride your first time through, so we give it a double pass to make sure you don't miss anything essential. In the first ten chapters, we'll hit the high spots of alchemy, themes, and symbols with a chapter-by-chapter -chapter introduction that takes a large view of the whole series, one subject at a time. We start, for example, with magic in literature because many readers don't see how that can be religious in any way when every revealed tradition forbids playing with magic. After that, we take similar long-range looks at the hero's journey, literary alchemy, and how symbols work. Then, when we've made the first trip through, and we understand what all the little marks on the Marauder's Map mean, we'll jump into the seven Harry Potter novels themselves, one at a time, to see what we can make of them. 
I'll explain the religious meaning and Christian content of each book, as well as why I think readers respond to them the way they do. Your job is to grasp what I explain and to see what I missed. This is the fourth edition of this book, and every update has been improved by readers who have written me to share something meaningful that I missed. Where does this all come from? Before we dive in, though, I am obliged to answer three questions I am inevitably asked at public talks I give. Do I really think Rowling intentionally gave the books all this meaning? Have I ever met Rowling? Has she confirmed that this was what she was doing? And how did I figure all this stuff out? Do I really think Rowling intentionally gave the books all this meaning? This is a polite way of saying, John, could you be imagining all this? I have three reasons for thinking J.K. Rowling is a profound writer who writes at several levels, some of which are well below the storyline. First, the woman has a first-rate education. Many readers familiar with the Cinderella story of her being a single mom on the dole when she wrote the first book imagine she was a welfare mother without a high school diploma who just got lucky. The truth is that she has an education and a degree equivalent to graduating from a prestigious American liberal arts college, say Middlebury or Wesleyan, with a major in French and a minor in classics. She has said her stories come from the compost pile of books she has read, and I'm guessing this pile is several stories high. Second, Rowling didn't dash off these stories. She claims she first thought of Harry Potter on a train in 1990, in the seven years before the first book was published, and in the ten years it took to write and publish the seven books. Rowling planned, replanned, and filled notebooks with backstory she would never use in the published novels. Planning is her recommendation to all young authors, and it is the signature of her genius as a writer. There is nothing accidental or off-the-cuff about her work. If it's in there, she put it in there deliberately. And third, the suggestion that Rowling didn't mean the books to be as profound as they are misses out on something essential. A lot of the most profound meaning of the books is the formula of how the books are written, the things that happen again and again in every book. Harry's resurrection from the dead in the presence of a symbol of Christ could be accidental once, granted, but his doing it seven times without a variant is hard to scratch off as something unintentional. Rowling is, first and last, an accomplished storyteller, and the profound meaning of her writing is evident in the weave of the story fabric she creates. Have I ever met Rowling? Has she confirmed that this was what she was doing? In words of one syllable, no. <laughs> I have not met Rowling, and no, she has not told me one thing about her books. I think these questions are also polite ways of saying something completely different from the surface meaning. Folks who ask me this, as a rule, believe that only authors understand their books, and anyone else who interprets their fiction is just guessing. Having just written that Rowling is a very intelligent and very intentional, even formulaic writer, let me rush to add that she would be an unusual writer, perhaps the first in history, if she understood her book's meanings comprehensively, or even much better than very intelligent readers. She certainly does not have a monopoly on interpreting her books. I like to think, in fact, as neat as it would be to talk with Rowling someday, that our conversation wouldn't be about the meaning of Harry Potter. From what I understand of such things from reading other authors, Talking about her book's meaning would be just about the most insulting thing I could do. In other words, asking Rowling what she meant in her stories is insulting. If what she meant is not discernible to a serious reader, I would be saying implicitly that she is a poor writer, and by restricting the meaning of the works to the author's intention and understanding of them, I would be suggesting that she as author is a god fully conscious of her influences, prejudices, and meanings to every reader, and aware of every valence and meaning of her story's symbols. I admire Rowling enough as an artist and a person that I do not want to diminish her remarkable literary accomplishment or suggest she is something more than human. 
two of the themes within the Harry Potter novels are that we respect people for who they are, and that we struggle to come to terms with the limits of individual understanding. Let's avoid the celebrity school of interpretation that believes only writers understand their books. It leaves all the fun to the writers and insults them horribly in the bargain. How did I figure all this stuff out? Here at last is an honest question. The answer will probably disappoint you. Not only have I not spoken with Rowling, we also grew up on opposite shores of the Atlantic Ocean. Not much common ground there, at least in a literal sense. Comparing and contrasting our worldviews and educations, though, I think it's fair to say that despite significant differences, our ways of looking at the world have been calibrated with similar prescription eyeglasses. Examples? Rowling grew up as something of a Hermione, a nerd, who studied more than her share of classical and modern languages. I studied Latin, Greek, and German in high school and was certainly a geek. She chose to go to church, Anglican Communion, even though her parents and sister did not, and sought baptism and confirmation on her own as an adolescent. I was baptized as an infant into the Anglican Communion ECUSA. And when my family stopped going to church when I was in high school, I continued to attend and was confirmed alone among my siblings. We both read and reread C.S. Lewis, Jane Austen, and the rest of the English greats because we loved the stories and the genius of the storytellers. I became interested in esoteric and literary alchemy while still in college and have continued to study its history and place in literature since. Rowling said in 1998, that she read a ridiculous amount about alchemy before writing Harry, and that alchemy set the magical parameters and internal logic of the series. I could go on, but let's leave it at this. Both in interpreting what Rowling is saying, and in the rather more bizarre field of guessing what she was going to write, my track record since 2002 has been good enough that I have been a keynote speaker at every Harry Potter conference of any size in the last five years, not to mention being interviewed by more than 100 radio stations, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and Time Magazine. Odds are pretty good you've even seen my face as well, because I've been on national television to answer Harry questions on CNN and MSNBC, and for an A&E special that eventually became a DVD extra in the Order of the Phoenix movie package. I've taught online classes to international audiences at Barnes & Noble University. I blog daily on hairy subjects, and I've written a book about how Rowling does what she does, Unlocking Harry Potter, Five Keys for the Serious Reader. But to answer your question about how I figured all this stuff out, it always comes back to that fact that we share a similar eyeglasses prescription, same church upbringing, same kind of classical education, same 19th century dinosaur reading list, same interest in, can you believe it, alchemy. Which brings us back again to our overarching question, why does everybody love Harry Potter? Believe it or not, the answer is that it's the transcendent meaning of the books, and specifically their Christian content, with which readers resonate. Go on to the next page and let's begin our trip through the mythical and religious meaning that drives Potter mania.